morning, everybody. Welcome to our 11 a.m. service. Um, the call to worship comes from Psalm chapter 90, verses 1 through 4. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you have formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our God who is forever and everlasting. In, the, in everything that is te so temporary, Lord, we are honored to be in the presence of the one who is from the beginning and the end and creator of the world. We want to offer you our worship this morning. We want to offer you our praise this morning with a joyful heart. We pray that you will be here in this room as we come together and, and learn your scripture, sing your songs, and give everything that we have to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, good morning, church. Let's stand and uh, let's turn to our neighbors and say good morning. And just ask uh, how everyone's week was. Hope everyone had a wonderful week. So I, uh, I had a crazy week because uh, I was in week two. I'm uh, working at this camp that my kids go to. I'm teaching tennis to five and six years old, six year olds, and I've literally been yelling all week because they don't listen. So my voice is a little hoarse, uh, but you know, coming into God's house, uh, I never want to let my my sore throat or my hoarse voice to get in the way of worshiping our king so um, you know before we start you know let's just take just a, a few seconds um, to really thank God for this week uh, whether it was good or bad we can always offer it we always offer it up to God and we give it to him and so let's just take a few few seconds and pray and we'll begin Lord and 
Jesus, all of you is all I need. Take every day. God, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the honor to worship you, God. Thank you for creating us, Lord, giving us life, giving us the breath that we breathe right now. Lord, it is because of you we exist. Lord, and it is for you, Lord, that we are created for, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you would accept, Lord, our offering, our worship offering to you this morning. God. Lord, all of, all of our worries and anxieties and all of our stress says, Lord, um, Lord, I pray that we can lay it at the foot of the cross, God, and surrender it all to you, Lord. And most importantly, Lord, help us to surrender our lives to you, all that we are, all that we have, God. We give it to you, Jesus. Lord, we owe you our lives, Lord, for the work that you did on the cross. So help us to never forget. your goodness, your faithfulness, Lord, and your love, your grace, your mercy over your children. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Deacon Joe will pray for us. Let's pray. Father God, we praise your glorious name, and we thank you for gathering us here to worship your mighty name here today. You are the creator of heaven and earth, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. You are holy, righteous, and faithful in all your ways. You are worthy of all our honor, your glory, and power. Father God, we confess that we are sinners in need of your grace. We have rebelled against you and disobeyed your commands. We have fallen short of your glory and your standards. We have not loved you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, and we have not been faithful stewards of the gifts and resources that you have bestowed upon us. We have not been fruitful in your service and mission. Forgive us, Lord, and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Let us reflect now on the last week of our unfaithfulness and sin. Father God, we thank you for your mercy and love. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sin. We thank you for rising him from the dead and giving us the hope of eternal life. We thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to dwell in us and transform us. We thank you for adopting us as your children and making us your heirs. We thank you for accepting us in the beloved and declaring us righteous in your sight. We thank you for your promises, your grace, and your peace. Father God, we thank you for your blessings and your provision. We thank you for our loyal congregation who love you and serve you. We thank you for our lay leaders, our deacons, our elders, pastors who lead us and guide us. We thank you for the gifts and the talents that you have given to each of us and the opportunities you give us to use them for your glory, Lord. We thank you for the fellowship and the unity we have in Christ. We thank you for the joy and the hope that we have in you. Our Father God, we pray for your will and your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for your church and your mission, that you would strengthen, protect, and empower your people to be your witnesses in the world. We pray for our guest speaker, Pastor Joe, that you would anoint him with your spirit and your word and that you would use him to speak to our hearts and minds. We pray for our community and our nation, 
that you would heal, restore, and bless all of us. We pray for the poor and the oppressed, the sick and the suffering, the lost and the lonely, that you would comfort, help, and save them. We pray for ourselves and our families, that you would guide, provide, and sustain us. We pray for all our needs and requests, that you would hear, answer, and fulfill them according to your will. Our Father God, we thank you for this time of prayer and worship. We thank you for hearing us and being with us. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and Lord. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is our Comforter and our Counselor. We thank you for your grace and your love. And we pray all these things in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a few announcements. Please refer to the bulletin for those I may miss. Uh, welcome to our 11 a.m. service. Uh, for next week, please note that there will be a joint service with KMEM for both 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. service. It will be at the main chapel. Uh, translation will be provided for those who need it. And um, this will be probably m more of a regular basis. We, we believe that's going to happen at least once a month going forward. Uh, and Pastor Joe will be uh, speaking for us um, on other weeks that we're not in joint service. The family worship night is scheduled for the next four weeks on Wednesdays. Please uh, refer to the bulletin for the schedule. Uh, and lastly, the Native American missions. Please refer to the date, and if you are interested, please contact Pastor Simon. With that, let's all rise for our scripture reading today. Uh, scripture reading today is Matthew chapter chapter 5 verse 4 Matthew chapter 5 verse 4 Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted Amen Please be seated Good morning. I'm glad to see you. Uh, good morning. So frankly, the preparing sermon in English is a little hard for me, but it's a blessing to share the love of God, the, God, the word of God with you. Uh, I hope that the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will open our hearts and ears to understand the word of God. I will continue to think about the sermon on the, on the mountain. Uh, whenever I have chance, I share of God with you. Last week, I told you uh, the importance of the Sermon on the Mountain. In his sermon, Jesus wanted to build the spiritual kingdom of God, gave his followers a Lord map regarding the kingdom of God. He also teaches his disciples and the people of Israel who are, who are the people of the kingdom of God and how they sh should live in this world through this sermon. The Sermon on the Mountain is still valid for us because it confirms, it confirms the unchanging truth of God to believers living in this fast-changing world. It, have it, it has been like this before, but it seems that the value of new normal is spreading more quickly especially after the COVID-19. We are living in an era where things that were taken for granted are no longer accepted. In other words, many modern people seem confused about the meaning and the purpose of life. In this trend of times, I would, uh, I would like to confirm our identity and calling as a people of God through the Sermon on the Mountain. As I emphasized the last week's sermon, Jesus declared blessings. Jesus declared the blessings on the first head of his first sermon. In verse 3, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why is there a blessing to the poor in spirit? Because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Even though our body are still in this land, 
God let them experience heaven's blessing in other bands. That means there is the kingdom of God. God let us experience heaven's blessing in other bands while we are still in this land. When people came to God, came to Jesus with repentance and humble heart, He gives them freedom, comfort, joy that the world cannot give. So, as you empty the things of the world in you and move on to the Lord with humble hearts, I'm sure that God will bless you with abundant heavenly blessings. Amen. And then Jesus mentioned the second blessing in verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Like the blessings for the poor in spirit, this blessing for those who mourn is paradoxical, right? In general, it's a blessing to smile rather than to grieve. Of course, some people cry when, they're, when they are happy. Does it mean that Christians should cry every day, not laugh? Should cry every day? Because he just said that those who mourn are blessed? No. But as you know, the Bible also says, Rejoice always. In Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, Rejoice always. Both are the word of God. So what should we do? Should we grieve or should we rejoice? Should we raise our hand to check? <laughs> should we grieve or should we rejoice? Aren't they the opposite words? If you try to look at them literally, you cannot understand them well. So first, we must carefully examine who Jesus is talking about as those who mourn. This sorrow that Jesus means is related to the words of the prophet Elijah. Let's look at Isaiah, Isaiah 61 verse 3. We saw last week. To grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of the gladness instead of mourning, the garments of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. In the Old Testament, Zion is the same place as Jerusalem, where the temple of God stood. And it is also called the city of King David. In fact, What's more important than Zion's location is the biblical meaning contained in Zion. Zion means the place where God's salvation begins and God blessed his people. It's Psalm 14 verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. The salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. And the Lord restores the fortune of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Also, Psalm 128, verse 5 and 6. The Lord bless you from Zion. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your days. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. So Zion means the place where God's salvation begins and the God blesses his people. As I said last week, the people who he heard Isaiah's prophecy were those who were taken into the captivity of Babylon. They saw Jerusalem and the temple broken down by their enemy. But God said, it is not over yet. It is not over yet for those who thought, God has abandoned us. We are doomed. Through Isaiah, God promises like this. 
Even though Zion is destroyed in your eyes, I am still the one who can give salvation and blessings to people of Zion. I will turn your mourning into gladness when you return to me. In this background, what is the sorrow that Jesus means? What is the sorrow that Jesus means? It refers to the state of spiritual sadness. Spiritual sadness. Specifically, it's a sorrow caused by people who forget God and live away from God. It's a grief from the foolishness of humans created in the image of God to confront and ignore Him. It's a pain caused those who look down on God for not responding to those who do illegal acts and even mocks God for claiming there is no God. It's sorrow for people who cannot avoid the wrath and the judgment of God in the end. With this sorrow, I, prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah offered many prayers for tears. Jeremiah 8, 18 to 19. My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick within me. Behold, the city of the daughter of my people, from the length and the breadth of the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved image and with their foreign idols? It is not just prophet of the Old Testament on the cross. Jesus also prayed for sorrow due to the unrighteous. Luke 23, 34, and Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Stephen, the first matter of the early church, romantic and prayed like this. Acts 7, verse 59 to 60. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Lord, do not hold these sins against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Today, such prayers are needed. It is time for people of God to mourn and pray, especially considering how far this country, founded by the forefather of faith, is away from God and against God. This generation is trying to deny biblical values and conceal the truth of, true of God with false things by realizing homosexuality and by disturbing the law of creation and family system which God, has, God was established. We need to do current is pray for this nation and a rebellious generation with a woeful heart. And there's one more thing we need to grieve for. It's a sinful nature that remains in us, which tempts us to live in compromise with this world. We must live like the image of God, image of the Holy God, like a new creation, fighting sin, but we fail a lot. We fail a lot. I thought about this. Why couldn't the people of Israel stop idolatry? Why couldn't the people of Isaiah, Israel stop idolatry? Did they really believe the golden idols would save and bless them? Of course they could. But more likely, they just disobeyed God and worshipped idols even though they knew what the Lord will. If it were later, what would be the reason? Perhaps it was a burdensome and difficulty. 
It was burdensome and difficult to live against the world, according to the Holy God. They might, might have thought like this. Many people in the world just do what they want and find it comfortable. Why do I have to live so hard? Why do I have to live so hard? It's un uncomfortable. It's frustrating. I don't care the truth or anything. I just want to live like them. Maybe we could often think that too. If so, there's something to think about here again. Obviously, Jesus told us that you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. You will know the truth and the truth sets you free. But why do we still live as if we are bound by the law? While meditating on the Bible, my conclusion is this. It's because a law for God has been cooled down. A law for God has been cooled down. What does it mean that we love God? What does it mean that we love God? It's not a just saying of lips, right? Have you ever loved someone, right? What happens if, if, if you love someone? Don't you want to know about her and her more? Do anything with the person and do whatever the loved one likes and wants, right? The same goes for loving God. The same goes for loving God. If we love God, we would like to resemble Him and live as He is pleased. Like holy God, you would like to live a holy life and voluntarily do things that God is pleased. But what will happen if the love cools down? Only habits and duties remain. And it's first reading. There is no joy in singing praise, no desire to pray, and even if we are, we are in the place of worship, our heart is still cold. Then we might up end, end up, we might end up in the state of confusion. Where we don't even know why we worship. Do you remember Moses' will? What is Moses' will to the next generation? To not to be like the first generation of Exodus who defied and disobeyed God and died in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel. Shema, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The problem begins when our love for God cools down. Problem begins when our love for God cools down. So we should grieve for our sinful nature who say, we love you, we love Jesus, we love God, but still try to love ourselves more. We must grieve for our deep-rooted sinful nature of trying to keep looking back on things in the world, like lost wife, because of sinfulness. Deep-rooted sinful nature. Even the Apostle Paul romanted in Romans Chapter 4, 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? When we hear the word of God, we think, yes, like you said, we will live according to your will. But you know, we are not changed well. Therefore, we should grieve for our stubbornness. I hope we can pray like this with a moan from heart. God, please help us to love you more. Please help us to love you more. Give us a holy desire to get to know you more and to become more like Jesus, like we praised.
What kind of blessing does Jesus promise to those who mourn? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. For they shall be comforted. The Greek word translated as comfort, comfort is parakaleo in Greek. Parakaleo is a compound word. Para means next to, and kaleo means call or invite. Literally, these words means that God calls the grieving by his side. Expanding a little more, this comfort means to call those who mourn by his side, wipe away their tears, and embrace them. Let me read Isaiah 61 verse 3 again. To grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of prayer instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that may he may be glorified. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. For the sorrow to be changed into joy, and for tears to be changed into praise. Amen. In more detail, the, the Lord's comfort for those who mourn can be categorized into three in the Bible. The first is realistic comfort, which can be call, also called present comfort. Jesus came to Messiah, healed the sick, and restored the painful minds, painful minds from sin. Jesus visited those who were marginalized and ignored. He embraced them and became their friends and freed them from evil spirit and bondage. Even now, when you call his name, when you call his name, when you call his powerful, wonderful, mighty his name, he saved us from our difficulty and frustration, such as a storm that we cannot handle. Matthew eleven twenty. Come to me. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the present comfort. Second, the Lord promises ultimate comfort. You can say it is future comfort. Some Christians lose their possession or families because of unexpected accident in a sinful world. There are also people who must live with disability all their lives for the reason we don't know well. What in the world? What in the world can comfort these people? Only Jesus can comfort them through the hope of resurrection. Amen? Only Jesus can comfort them through the hope of resurrection. Jesus promised that when he came back, he would raise his people with a new spiritual body, the image of the man of heaven. And he promised heaven with no more pain and no more death. Revelation 20 verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And that shall be no more. Neither shall, neither shall be, there will be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. The third is relational comfort, which can be called eternal comfort. What makes this comfort different from the previous two is that this transcends time and place. And this comfort already has begun and lasts forever. That's relational comfort. When Jesus said he was going to his father, he said to his disciple, who are afraid of, of being left alone. John 14, 18. I will not leave you as orphaned. I will come to you. 
as he promised. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to all who confess Jesus as their Lord. And the Holy Spirit is by us, in us, now. You know, there is a nickname of the Holy Spirit. It's Counselor. In Greek, this word is parakletos. Did you notice? Parakleo and parakletos. Literally, it means that Holy Spirit is God who is comforting. Holy Spirit is God who is comforting. That's the parakletos. He embraces us with his everlasting arms. He holds our hands tightly. and never misses us. Isaiah 41.10 Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. On the contrary, There is a warning from Jesus for those who live satisfied with worldly things and laugh. Luke 6.25b O oh, to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and laugh and weep. As I mentioned earlier, laughing is not a problem. Actually, joy is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? However, the laughter Mentioned here refers to the laughter of those who indulge in worldly pleasure and live in debauchery. At the same time, it is the laughter of those who follow worldly laws and ways, mocking those who strive to live according to the will of God. It is the laughter of those who disregard God, the church, and the people of God. In s i m p l e word, it may sometimes seem that those who commit unlawful acts boast and appear, appear to prevail. However, their laugh is temporary. Their laugh is temporary. Jesus warned that their laugh will be turned into mourning. O oh, to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. In conclusion, who is blessed? Who is blessed? Blessed are those who mourn, for they be, shall be comforted. Jesus tells the citizen of the kingdom of heaven that those who mourn are blessed. The heavenly blessing given to those who mourn over a world that rebels, rebels God, against God and over the sin that causes the causes us to stumble is present, future, and eternal comfort. The heavenly blessing is present, future, and eternal comfort. It's realistic, ultimate, and relational. If any are here today feeling discouraged and weary from fighting the good fight of faith in this world from injustice, I hope you find renewed strength. As you hear the Lord saying, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. I know you. I know your sorrow. I know you. Well then, good and faithful servants. Let's pray together. Hide me now under your wings. Cover me with your mighty hands. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still know you are God. Find rest, my soul, in Christ alone. Know his power in quietness and trust. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. All be still know you are God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, church, let's stand and let's respond.
Under your wings, cover me within your mighty hand. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar. Find rest, my soul, in Christ alone. Know His power, in quietness and trust. When the oceans rise. So with you above the song, Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still, know you are God. When the oceans rise, when the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will so with you. share a few prayer topics for you to pray together. Let us pray with a grieving heart for this nation and the next generation. May this country and its people remember God's truth. Turn away from their wicked and sinful ways and return to the Lord. Help us to love God more. Grant us a heart that seek to know Jesus more and to become more like you. May the Holy Spirit help us to break our servantness and enable us to live in a way that please and honor God. Let's pray together.
His favor be upon you and the thousand generation and your family and their children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and the thousand generation and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going and your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you, he is for you, he is for you, he is for you. I sing amen. Father God, here are your children who love you. Even though we may encounter things that causes, causes us to mourn in this sinful world, help us not to be discouraged. Instead, let us experience your comfort. 